This is our last class on heaven. And if things go well, we'll be there before the end of class. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. Um, hopefully, not because of a tragedy, but because of the rapture. Um, although, you know, I mean, if the building blows up and we all die and go to heaven, that's, that's not bad either. Um, all right, notes in the back. It's the exact same page as last week. Uh, we're finishing up today. Next Sunday, Nick Gehring will kick off a new class series called Love is a Verb. Um, should be good. I encourage you to join us. Um, let's get started. We've got a lot to cover in 40 minutes. Lord Jesus, thank you for our time. Thank you, thank you that we can be here. Thank you for this uh, amazing hope that we have that you have prepared a place for us to go, that we can be with you forever and ever. I pray for our time. I pray for uh, understanding. I pray for encouragement. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's jump right in. Uh, this is where we have been. Uh, these are the main points that we've looked at. Um, and then last week, we started activities in heaven. What are we going to do in heaven? And we looked at rest which sounds wonderful. We're going to rest, and then we're going to worship. We kind of ended the class with the idea that we will be worshiping uh, for all eternity uh, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Lamb of God. And uh, let's jump into this new point today, which is we're going to do some work. We're going to be uh, doing some kind of service uh, though, they, though we will finally be at rest and resting, that doesn't mean uh, heaven is going to be one long eternal nap. Although on days, some days that sounds awful good, doesn't it? Um, there will be tasks for us to do, tasks of ministry and service. And we just have hints at those. We don't know for sure. Uh, Matthew 19, 28 hints at the task of judging. No idea what that is, just so you know. Uh, the verse says, Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And later at the Last Supper, Jesus told his, his, his disciples in Luke 22, you are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you a kingdom, just as my Father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. No, just what that is, we don't know. I don't, we don't know what that looks like. Um, perhaps each of us will be assigned a town in the new heavens and the new earth, and we get to rule over that town uh, in this perfect created world. Um, Adam, if you recall, prior to the fall, Adam was to rule over the garden uh, and the earth so he had service to perform. If you recall, the curse was not bringing work about. The curse was making work difficult. Work is not part of the curse. Sorry, those of you that think that's the case. Um, the curse is that you will be sweating, it'll be difficult, it'll be hard, it'll be frustrating. So work is not wrong. Work is not evil. So for there to be work in the eternal heaven seems perfectly logical. Um, in the uh, parable of the talents in Matthew 25, uh, one who is faithful with his work is given more work. That particular passage is set in, a, in an eschatological context or a, a last times context. So maybe those who are most faithful with their gifts and ministry on earth are given greater areas of service in heaven. Again, a lot of sanctified speculation. Um, John hints at some productive work in Revelation 21. And let me just look at verse 24. By its light, the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, into the new kingdom. What does it mean to bring their glory into the new kingdom? Uh, Isaiah 65 offers some suggestions. I'm going to read through this text. This is very confusing. Uh, it probably is mixing the millennial kingdom with the eternal heaven, uh, but it's worth looking at and considering and reflecting upon. So let me just read it with some commentary. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. Sounds like eternal heaven, right? New heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy. Probably a reference to the new Jerusalem. And her people to be gladness. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. No more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping and the cry of distress. Now that certainly sounds like eternal heaven. Right? Um, verse 20. No more shall there be in it an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not fill out his days. For the young man shall die a hundred years old, and the sinner a hundred years old shall be accursed. That doesn't quite sound like heaven, does it? Um, let's keep going. Verse 21. They shall build houses and ha inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be, and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. So are we going to build houses in heaven? Is this the millennial kingdom just mixed in with eternal heaven? And so often in the Old Testament prophecies, they jump thousands of years from one verse to the next, and you're like, wait a minute, what just happened? Um, Verse 22, they shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity, for they shall be the offspring of the blessed of the Lord and their descendants with them. I don't think we're going to have kids in heaven. Uh, verse 24, before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall graze together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, and dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountains, says the Lord. Okay, this is a fascinating text. Without a doubt, there is at least some reference to eternal heaven because at the very beginning it says, I created new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered. That's eternal heaven. But then there's all this other stuff going on. So, thoughts? Maybe that's the thousand years. Uh, the millennium? Sure. That, that would be the thousand-year kingdom. The demons are released for a time. Jesus conquers them, wins, and we go into the new heaven and new earth. That's my best guess is what's happening in this text. But I still think it's interesting that it, 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 in all of the mixed-up references, we're going to build houses and plant vineyards. At least. Yes, it could be. M Mark. Sure. You know, I thought about the New Jerusalem. And he's going to have a home for us there. But that may not be our primary home. The fact that we have a place to come and worship our King and our, and our Lord God in, in the city of Jerusalem provides a place to stay. And yet we could be possibly outside. Sure, we'll be in Kansas raising wheat. I don't know. Yes. They're bringing their glory into the kingdom through the gates, yeah. Yeah, no, that's good. Other thoughts, questions, observations? I, I, we can't say definitively what's going on here, but I think we can say definitively we won't be bored in heaven. Um, we will have things to do. We'll have tasks to accomplish. Uh, the tasks that we have to accomplish will be pure joy, pure pleasure, and not in any way burdensome. The, the curse will be removed, so when the curse brought difficulty to work, that's gone. Work will be a joy. Doesn't that sound awesome? Whatever it is. Um, Mm, yes. Else, I want time. Oh. We'll have time. We'll have time. I, I imagine at least there'll be coffee shops in heaven, and we'll be able to go to a coffee shop with David and chat, or or the heavenly equivalent of that. Yeah.
All right, let's keep going. What else are we going to do in heaven? Community. We're going to have community. Uh, this came up a while back in, in some class, or in this class. Um, it would seem that heaven will be a place of fellowship and community. Uh, Hebrews 12 says, You have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. So the angels are in joyful assembly. So there's community. The church is there. The church is a place of fellowship. The church is a community. Um, so the, we're not going to be in isolation. There's going to be some kind of fellowship that takes place. Um, let me just throw it out there. What do you think this fellowship will be like? Are we going to get together for coffee and share our problems? No, there won't be problems. Or aches and pains, yeah. What, what, what will this fellowship be like? God's faithfulness. Hey, I talked to David the other day. You wouldn't believe what he told me. Well, I was talking to Elijah. You wouldn't believe what he told me. You know, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know. But there's going to be perfect fellowship and community. Now, my big question is, will introverts still be introverts in heaven? <laughs> And look at the line of people lined up to talk to him. I'm just going to go back to my little castle in New Jerusalem on the second, 272nd thousandth floor, whatever. I don't know. I, 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 it's going to be awesome. Let's keep going. Well, this is the last section, issues. Um, any, any final comments on our activities in heaven? That's pretty kind of pretty sketchy, but that's kind of all we have, um, all that this, the text gives us. All right, issues. This is a collection of assorted questions and issues regarding heaven. It's by no means exhaustive. There's a lot of issues that aren't addressed here, but these are things that I've gleaned from reading and so on. Um, and it'll address some questions. First of all, are there physical pleasures in heaven? Uh, Psalm 1611 says, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So what are these pleasures forevermore? What form will these pleasures take? Well, let's talk about marriage and sex. And if you were at the first service, I'm going to reference Greg's sermon. If you weren't, I'll try not to do any spoilers, okay? Fair enough. How many were in the first service? Okay, good, bunch of you. Uh, Matthew 22:30 tells us that there will be no marriage in heaven. Sex was only designed by God for marriage. So since heaven's a perfect place, we can assume that there will be no sex, no sexual pleasure. But in light of what Greg was preaching this morning, um, and again, I don't want to get weird, like he was saying, I don't want to get weird, but I, think, I don't think we should be weird talking about sex, first of all. Um, we will have a perfect union with Christ. We are, the, the, the end of his graph was we are lovers with God, um, and that union will be perfect, and whatever pleasure that brings will be epic. Um, I believe that marriage and a sexual union within marriage is simply a foretaste of our union with Christ. And um, hopefully that's not weird, because that's very biblical. Uh, the language in scripture is, in many places, quite explicit. And I think it, it reflects more our, we, our weirdness than it does God's perspective. So um, there'll be no need for marriage or sexual pleasure in heaven because we'll be perfectly fulfilled. Thoughts, questions, disagree, agree. Okay. By the way, I disagree with Greg's interpretation of Song of Solomon. I'm just going to go on the record right now. <laughs> I'm hoping to teach Song of Solomon in this class in the next few years. Uh, I believe Song of Solomon is God's book given to married couples describing the sexual union, marriage, pleasure, joys. It is graphic. It is erotic. It is explicit. And it's tasteful. And it's delicate. 
And I think it's beautiful. And I think um, sex is such a huge part of life and culture and dysfunction. Surely God would dedicate a book of the Bible to dealing with that topic. Um, so, and, and I've already talked to Greg about this. He knows. I don't agree. So I'm not talking behind his back. And he even said, you know, some say this, some say this, and, but I tend to think this. All right, let's keep going. Eating and drinking. On to more pleasures. Will we eat and drink in heaven? Um, Revelation 19.9 talks about the marriage supper of the Lamb. Luke 22, Jesus told the disciples he would not eat or drink until the kingdom comes in. Uh, Revelation 22.2 tells us the tree of life bears a crop of fruit every month. What reason would a tree have to bear a crop of fruit if not to eat it? Um, Jesus ate with his glorified body after he rose from the dead. Uh, he was on earth for, what, 40 days, and he ate fish. So his glorified body, which ours will be similar to his, uh, will be able to eat. Um, uh, so we can assume that there will be the pleasure of eating and drinking in heaven, and I'll bet the food will be epically delicious. I, I, I can't even comprehend. And no, I don't know if we'll eat meat or not. It doesn't seem like we would because that requires death. Uh, third point here, um, 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 10 says, However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. I think the pleasures that will exist in heaven, the, the delights, uh, if I can use the word fun, are just absolutely beyond our ability to comprehend. Uh, we can only uh, use perspectives that we have on earth when we talk about pleasure uh, to try to grasp what the pleasures in heaven will be. And it's just going to be a blast to find out. Um, any questions or thoughts on the f this first issue? Are there physical pleasures in heaven? All right, next question. Oh, I'm sorry. Is there going to be alcohol in heaven? I believe there'll be wine. I'll put it that way. Um, Jesus made wine. Um, I don't think it's grape juice. I don't think... I, I think... Yes. <laughs> um, with some caveats. Uh, I believe uh, wine is an incredible picture of blessing... Of, of prosperity all through scripture. In fact, I'm, did I say this last week? I'm about to buy a book that's just been published by a, a, a lady who grew up in a, a winery in Germany and she's a theologian. Did I say this last week? I, obviously it's on my mind. Um, it, has, it hasn't come out yet, but I'm anxious to buy it and read the, A Theology of Wine. It sounds weird, I know. No, there will not be drunkenness. There will be no, you know, like beer blasts or beer pong or anything like that. Whatever the use of alcohol will be, it will be perfect. If if it, if if it's even there. Um, so that's a. It's kind of like talking about sex because there is so much dysfunction around sex that we get a little worried talking about. There's so much dysfunction around alcohol that we get a little nervous talking about it. I believe God's best gifts are the ones that Satan has distorted the worst. And that would include food, drink, sex, relationships. Uh, they have caused the greatest pain on earth because Satan's going to try to destroy God's best. That's my view of how that all works. And whatever it is, it'll be perfected in heaven. Good. Good questions. That's a good way of looking at it. God's best gift is Satan. Yeah. Yep. All right. B, will there be satisfaction in our perfection? Interesting question. Let's talk about this. Heaven's gotten a bad rap so often because it must be boring. Um, much of 
life's satisfaction and fulfillment that we experience comes from growth and development, comes from learning new skills, uh, getting a master's degree, getting, you know, advancing your education, reading and learning things, uh, maturing in our character. A lot of the satisfaction in life comes from those kinds of things. Now, since in heaven we will have attained a state of completeness and perfection, will there be no more growth or advancement, thus no more satisfaction in experiencing that? Will heaven be boring and unsatisfying for those reasons? Uh, of course, the problem here is we're trying to imagine life in a heavenly dimension based on our life on this earthly dimension. Um, this is a little philosophical, so just hang on here. Uh, when growth is stopped or hindered, growth in our lives, for whatever reason, there's frustration because we've been stopped short of that ultimate goal of perfection. Our character, we, went, we got stuck in this character issue, and so we're frustrated. Um, if we were to attain that goal of perfection, there would be nothing more to strive for, so there would be no opportunity for frustration. Thus, striving would cease, and satisfaction would be complete. Satisfaction in this life comes from knowing that we have moved closer to the goal. Satisfaction in heaven will be complete because we have reached the goal. Thoughts? Yeah, perfection, I would say, is, is completeness, but not complete knowledge. We, I think we looked at that last week. We, we won't be omniscient, I don't believe, once we get there. So there can still be a, a learning process, right? Yeah, and I, I would ask the question, if there is growth in heaven, and I agree with you, I think there is, there is not maybe not growth in character, right. but growth in knowledge and awareness. What, what does that growth look like and I mean, we're kind of answering our questions as we're talking here. And, and I also fully expect to know or, or learn more and more about God every day I'm there, right? So we're not going to get bored about learning about God. Uh, it's not like day one. We'll have Instant knowledge. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I would agree. And will it be learning or will it be them experiencing it? Either way, it's growth, right? <laughs> So I guess the answer to that question is we really won't be perfectly complete. We'll be sinlessly complete, but there will be new dimensions to attain. New relationships. Um, there's going to be, is it fair to say hundreds of millions of people in heaven? I don't know. I didn't do the math and think about this. There's going to be a lot. But we have all eternity. So are we going to run out of stuff to do at some point? Yeah. I don't think we'll ever stop learning about how wide and how high and how long. You just think of the Greg's six levels that he went. We're going to we're going to experience, I think we'll be in the bottom tier of that. But what does that look like? I know. Yeah. No, I I think there will be satisfaction in whatever we are ever we are, yet we will continue to learn more and become even more satisfied. Okay, good. The more you know, the more you want to know. Yeah. Um, yeah, we'll just keep growing. All right, next question. That, that one was always weird to me, that, that one. So uh, how much will we remember? Will we remember our sins and failures, our successes and victories? Will we realize that 
uh, our mom and dad or our son and daughter aren't here in heaven with us. We'll remember our house in Wausau. We'll remember that vacation we took back in 2012. Uh, what will we remember? Well, uh, Revelation 21.4 says that all tears are wiped away, that there will be no more mourning and crying and pain. We can assume that we will not remember sins and failures. I think that's safe. Uh, I don't think we're going to miss, this is pure sanctified speculation. I don't think I'm going to know, and I'm, I'm on the assumption that my sister will not be in heaven. I don't think I'm going to know that in heaven. Um, I see some nodding. John. Right, right. That's the intermediate state. Uh, the wiping away tears comes after that, as near as we can tell. So perhaps um, my parents in heaven know that my sister's not a believer yet. But once the eternal state comes in and tears are wiped away, maybe not. Maybe we won't know. It just it would seem like a grief an eternal grief to know that people we know and loved are not there with us. And that's, again, that's pure speculation. Um, based on the text says, uh, he will wipe away every tear, death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning nor crying or pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. So, I, I disagree a little again. Uh, that's fine. Glory, glory to God because he, he, he forgave it. So that situation is not going to be a shameful memory. It's going to be it all was there for until he comes. Yeah, yeah. Our, our perspective is being changed so much that our sins are no longer something that God is angry with us. And maybe we'll see that maybe if that's true and we do remember the unsaved loved ones, it'll be as a reflection of God's glory, um, not... Oh, I miss my sister. But God is glorified in eternal justice as well as in eternal grace. Yeah, that's a good point. Good thought. I also think, and I love this, in regards to those who will not be heaven and who are forever in the lake of fire, I wonder, and this is just me thinking, if part of their eternal tormenting while Christians go on or are here in the rapture, Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's not a thing. Right. Which, as a believer, thank be God we won't have that. But for everyone here who heard it and lived it and didn't receive it, I think that's going to be a long time. Yeah. But that's just me. No, I, I, I would agree. Other thoughts? Um, this whole life is lived to prepare for heaven. Yet, how much of it will remember? And this is just an example that I read somewhere. How critical is the nine months in the womb for new, new life? How critical was that for you to be in your mother's womb for nine months? Pretty important, right? How many of you remember your time there? Um, we don't. And how many, how many of us who are older remember everything about our childhood? We don't. Um, I just wonder if the fullness of heaven will be so great that the things of the past will gradually, maybe instantly, fade away to where, you know, I'll run into somebody someday and say, remember, uh, we lived in Wausau together. I was like, Wausau, what's that? I don't remember living. Was that earth? Was that back in earth? You know, I, I don't know. I, we're, we're just speculating here. There's so much we're speculating about.
Yes. Yeah. I, I think that's, yeah, that's valid. Oh, no, we can't, because the lamb is seated on the throne, and it's a lamb because it was sacri- he was sacrificed. Yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting to think about because what, what's the point of the cross if there is no sin? What's the point of the lamb who was slain if there is no sin? Oh, Johnny got me thinking. That's good. This is good. All right, we'll keep going. Related question. Will we know each other in heaven? It would appear that the Bible presents at least a pretty strong case that yes, we'll recognize others in heaven. Uh, there's no marriage, but likely a supernatural ability to recognize one another. I doubt that I'll have to go around asking to find Hudson Taylor or King David because we'll know who he is. Um, in Second Samuel 12, David said that he would go to his son when his infant son died. So what point would there be if he didn't know his son? Uh, in Luke 9 at the Transfiguration, Peter, James, and John recognized Moses and Elijah. How could they recognize Moses and Elijah? Moses had died uh, 1,400 years earlier. Elijah had died 700 years earlier. There were no Facebook posts or pictures or anything. Um, They just had a supernatural ability to know this is Moses, this is Elijah. Um, uh, Luke 16, that John referenced, tells of the rich man and Lazarus. They knew each other, though each was in a different place of the intermediate state. Uh, Paul talks about his whole family in heaven and on earth. A family knows and is known. Um, I just want to read quickly one. uh, If if you haven't been here, I've been using this book, Imagine Heaven, by John Burke, who is a pastor, theologian, and has analyzed hundreds and hundreds of near-death experiences. Um, I use this cautiously, but it's well-researched and very biblical. And he cites... Um, uh, Dr. Von Lommel, a Dutch cardiologist. Um, I'll just read it. One of Dr. Van Lommel's Dutch patients described a near-death experience that had taken place when she was five years old after she had contracted meningitis and fallen into a coma. She recalled that after she died, she was free of fear and pain and actually felt quite at home in the place she found herself. At one point, she saw a young girl who looked to be about 10 years old. I sensed that she recognized me, she remembered. After the two girls embraced, the other girl said, I'm your sister. I was named after your grandmother. Our parents called me, I don't speak Dutch, but Richa, Richa for short. After kissing her, Richa said, you must go now. In a flash, the young girl with meningitis returned to her body and to the relief of her parents opened her eyes. She excitedly told her parents about her experience and even drew them a picture of the sister who had welcomed her. My parents were so shocked that they panicked, she recalled. They got up and left the room. When they returned, her parents confirmed that they indeed once had a daughter called Richa who had died of poisoning. They had decided not to tell their other children about Richa until they felt they were old enough to understand the meaning of life and death. Um, Again, there's just numerous accounts like that. Uh, and like I said at the beginning of this class, uh, prior to this, near-death experiences were the stuff of the National Enquirer. After reading this and seeing uh, respected theologians and biblical thinkers uh, analyze it, I think there's something to it. And some of, several of you have shared your own near-death experience situations. And Dawn, my wife, had one uh, several years back where she was in Narnia walking with Aslan. And uh, she had sepsis and was pretty close to going across the line. Uh, Came back. She was very upset that she came back. Uh, We're glad she did. But um, anyway, so they knew each other. They recognized each other. And so that takes us to another question. How old will we appear to be in heaven? This is really important. Um, here's, Here's this girl. She died as a young girl. She was seen in this experience as 10. Uh, In 1 Samuel 28, uh, when Saul goes to the witch at Endor and has her uh, conjure up Samuel, he said to her, what is his appearance? And she said, an old man is coming up and he is wrapped in a robe. And Saul knew that it was Samuel. So 
Samuel appeared as an old man. Um, the, these accounts of near-death experiences are interesting. Some report seeing children and infants, their own babies that had died. One girl reported seeing her miscarried sister, who was about her own age in heaven, or wherever she was. Uh, one man reported seeing his daughter, who had died at age two, as now all grown up. Uh, another report seeing a whole bunch of relatives who had died, and that they were all around 35, including his little brother, who died at age two. So maybe 35 is the perfect age. Uh, Burke's theory, and this is the guy that wrote this book, his theory is that we will appear ageless, yet we will have the ability to appear to others as the age they knew us best. So, 33, as near as we can tell. I think, I, I, I agree. I'm way past that. Um, <laughs> I remember passing 33 thinking, this is it, right here, perfect age. <laughs> gone, gone, gone. Um, one person in his book expressed surprise that her deceased relative looked so old, and they said that they could appear however they wanted and immediately change to a younger look. This is a near-death experience recounted here. Again, that's not scripture. It's just a book. This is Burke's conclusion, the guy who wrote this book, and I like this. Maybe our appearance of age can change in the intermediate heaven. I'm not sure what that would imply for our resurrected body's age in the new heaven and new earth. My vote is 29. So <laughs> now we have a 29. Uh, and I love this final phrase. One day we will know for sure. And that's the best we can do. Yeah, that's kind of what he's saying here too. Is is is, uh, you know, if if uh, sorry, Steve, I'll just pick on you. If Steve were to die right now, and then I would see him in heaven, I wouldn't know him as a ten-year-old boy. I'd know him as maybe, but I, absolutely. All right, uh, I have two more questions, two more issues. One is long. One is more important. Um, the next question is, will there be variation in rewards? I'm just going to say quickly, it appears that there is some indication that there's a variation in rewards. Uh, in Scripture, there's, there's a lot of evidence. Um, Revelation 22:12, I'm coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. How will this work? Am I going to walk down the street and go, man, you got a bigger mansion than I do, um, and feel bad? Um, a couple options is that rewards will be given at the judgment seat, and then all of those rewards will be cast at the feet of Jesus. So when we go into eternity in heaven, we won't know who had more or less. Uh, somebody else has said that uh, the rewards will consist in our different, differing abilities to enjoy the blessings of heaven. So there is no way I will know that you're enjoying it more or less than me. But you have a greater ability to enjoy it. Um, th these are just speculative ideas about um, what, how that might work. All right, last question, most important one. Will there be animals in heaven? <laughs> um, <laughs> Some say that Romans 8 speaks to this and that indicates there will be animals in heaven, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption of sons and so on. Reasoning goes like this. There were animals before the fall. In the Garden of Eden, when God created earth, there were animals. The whole of creation was affected by the fall. The earth, the animals, the insect life, uh, humanity was, were all affected by the fall. Uh, there is water and there is plant life in eternity, in the eternal heaven. Uh, there are animals in the millennial kingdom. We just read about the lion laying down with the lamb. That could be the millennial kingdom. It could be eternal heaven. Um, so there could be animals in eternity. Christ returns on a white horse 
to claim victory. Um, there's just no conclusive proof. I would say this, though. If there are animals in heaven, it won't be your beloved dog or cat or horse that died, probably. Um, you know, we had, a, we had a little dog named Piper. I don't think Piper would be in heaven anyway. Um, <laughs> but that's a, works, that's a works system right there. <laughs> uh, I don't think Piper will be in heaven. But there might be dogs in heaven. There might be animals for us to enjoy. And so on that note, are there any questions or disagreement with that? You want to... I wouldn't think, sorry Pete, um, Pete's dr dream of heaven was to fish for all eternity, but um, there's no death, so I'm assuming we won't eat meat either, which is a real bummer, um, but whatever it is we eat will be amazing. Maybe be lab grown. Be what? <laughs> lab grown. That's what I thought, like a soy product that just tastes like filet mignon. Um, all right, let's wrap the class up with this verse, the conclusion. In Revelation 22, John says, He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Uh, what else can we say? There are so many questions, so many issues, so many unknowns about heaven and what it will be like. But I trust, we've been here eight weeks. Um, I just counted up the, the dates yesterday. Uh, and there's so much more but so much of it is speculation too. So I trust you've been encouraged. I have trust you have a new vision of what's awaiting us someday, and it's an encouragement and a challenge to live, live hard for Jesus now. So Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for what you're preparing for us. Thank you for what's awaiting us. Thank you that in the meantime, we can just bask in the glow of relationship with you. Um, thank you, Lord. Amen.